The Cygnus cargo ship has successfully made it to the International Space Station despite the failure of one of its two solar arrays. The Cygnus vehicle, built by Northrop Grumman and named after the first American woman to fly to space, Sally Ride, was launched atop an Antares rocket from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia on November 7. The mission, designated NG-18, marked the 18th Cygnus supply ship to the space station since 2013. The cargo ship carried more than 3,700 kilograms of science experiments, food, and other supplies for the space station crew. The flight was its heaviest cargo delivery yet. A few hours after Cygnus reached orbit and separated from the rocket's upper stage, one of the spacecraft's two solar arrays failed to deploy. Teams on the ground initially attempted to troubleshoot the issue, hoping to pull the solar panel open, but they were unsuccessful. NASA and Northrop Grumman later decided to give up on those efforts to focus on carrying out a safe rendezvous with the ISS, noting that the spacecraft already had enough power to complete its journey. Cygnus arrived at the ISS two days after its launch, as the space station flew over the Indian Ocean. Video from the space station showed that while one of the circular arrays deployed as expected, the other barely unfolded. In a November 9 statement, Northrop Grumman attributed the array's unsuccessful deployment to debris from the rocket's acoustic blanket during stage separation. As the spacecraft approached the ISS, NASA astronaut Nicole Mann used the space station's robotic arm to grab onto the vehicle and drag it toward its docking port on the U.S. segment of the station. The vehicle will remain attached to the ISS until January and be loaded with trash and other unnecessary equipment before being sent back to Earth to be destroyed upon re-entry into the atmosphere. The next tree supply mission to the ISS, SpaceX's CRS-26, is scheduled to launch from Kennedy Space Center on November 21. Early on Thursday morning, Hurricane Nicole made landfall on Florida's eastern coast, forcing NASA to delay the launch of the Artemis I mission to the moon. The Space Launch System rocket carrying the Orion capsule was scheduled to lift off from Kennedy Space Center Pad 39B on November 14, but the launch attempt has now been rescheduled for November 16. In a blog update on Tuesday, NASA said that the rocket is designed to withstand 85 mph winds at 60 feet level and expected the wind not to exceed the SLS design limit. But from the publicly available data, it appears that the rocket was exposed to wind gusts above 85 mph at 230 feet on Thursday morning. A peak gust of 100 mph was reported on the National Weather Service site. In a statement on Thursday, Jim Free, Associate Administrator for NASA's Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, said that camera inspections following the hurricane's passage revealed very minor damage to the rocket and spacecraft, and NASA is planning to conduct additional on-site walk-down inspections on the vehicle. At the time of making this video, NASA is still targeting the Artemis I launch during a two-hour window that opens at 6.04 a.m. GMT on November 16. But if the agency finds that the rocket's structural integrity has been compromised after prolonged exposure to strong winds, the mission will be delayed again. United Launch Alliance's Atlas V rocket lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California on November 10, carrying two payloads toward low Earth orbit. The Centaur upper stage deployed the mission's primary payload, the Joint Polar Satellite System 2 satellite, 28 minutes after liftoff, placing it into a sun-synchronous orbit at an altitude of about 800 kilometers. The satellite is the second of four planned weather satellites in the Joint Polar Satellite System program, a collaboration between NASA and the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The satellites are designed to provide weather data and monitor the ocean, biodiversity shifts, wildfires, and floods. The secondary payload on the launch was the Low Earth Orbit Flight Test of an Inflatable Decelerator, or LOFTED, a technology demonstration of an inflatable heat shield. The upper stage deployed the inflatable decelerator on a re-entry trajectory 75 minutes after liftoff, allowing it to demonstrate how an inflatable aeroshell, measuring 6 meters wide, could slow down and survive atmospheric re-entry. The vehicle, which is expected to reach a maximum speed of nearly 30,000 km per hour during descent, appeared to perform as expected through re-entry. The heat shield slowed down the vehicle to 860 km per hour, as instruments on board collected data on the performance of the shield. After deploying parachutes to slow it down for the rest of its descent, Lofted splashed down in the Pacific east of Hawaii, two hours and 13 minutes after liftoff. A recovery vessel later picked up Lofted and a flight data recorder ejected from it before splashdown. Teams also recovered another set of the data stored aboard the heat shield. Lofted is based on hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator technology, which will potentially allow much heavier payloads to be safely landed on the surface of Mars than is currently possible.
Additionally, inflatable heat shields might make it possible to recover large rocket stages, such as the engine section of United Launch Alliance's forthcoming Vulcan rocket. Rocket Lab successfully launched a Swedish atmospheric science satellite on November 5, but a telemetry problem kept the company from attempting a mid-air recovery of the rocket's booster. The Electron rocket carrying the MATS satellite for the Swedish National Space Agency lifted off on the Catch Me If You Can mission from New Zealand last Saturday. The Mesospheric Airglow Aerosol Tomography and Spectroscopy Satellite, or MATS, weighing 54 kilograms, is designed for studying waves in the upper atmosphere and their impact on weather and climate. The satellite was deployed into a 585-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit from the rocket's upper stage about an hour after liftoff. Rocket Lab planned to snatch the Electron's first stage out of the sky with a helicopter equipped with a hook after the mission. Catching the booster in midair prevents it from reaching the ocean, eliminating the risk of hardware corrosion or damage from splashdown in saltwater and helps ease its reuse. However, video from the helicopter showed no sign of the booster, and Rocket Lab later said the midair catch had been called off due to telemetry loss from the booster during re-entry. The company made its first attempt at a mid-air recovery in May, and the hook was able to grapple the stage's parachute. However, the helicopter quickly freed the stage after observing load characteristics that were different from those seen during testing. Rocket Lab's next mission, which will be its first launch from U.S. soil, is slated to launch on December 7 from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, located within NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. The mission will be a commercial mission for the American geospatial analytics company, Hawkeye 360. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX is gearing up for the next round of Super Heavy Booster 7 pre-launch static fire tests. The week at Starbase began with a full-stack cryo-proof test on Monday morning. Booster 7's methane tank was filled to about 25% of its total capacity during the test, which equates to about 50 tons. The tank filling and draining operation lasted for about an hour. The same day evening, SpaceX conducted a two-minute-long orbital launch mount fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system test. The system will purge the launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, effectively cleaning and preventing any volatile mixtures of methane and oxygen underneath the pad before engine ignition. In this way, SpaceX can avoid anomalies like the one that occurred during the spin-prime test of Booster 7 on July 11. SpaceX has tested the system several times before, and the recent test was to ensure the system was operational ahead of static fire tests. While everyone was waiting for the full-stack 33-engine static fire test, NASA reported at an October 31 briefing that the plan had recently been changed, and the Booster 7's 33-engine test would take place without Ship 24. NASA and SpaceX may have come to this decision to minimize the damage of a potentially catastrophic explosion during the test. On Tuesday afternoon, with the help of Tower Arms, teams de-stacked Starship 24, which had been sitting atop Booster 7 for the past three weeks. By the time Ship 24 was de-stacked from Booster 7, SpaceX had completed seven full-stack cryo-proof tests. After de-stacking from Booster 7, Ship 24 was moved towards suborbital launch pad B, which had recently been modified to support Starship static fire testing. Ship 24 was lifted and placed atop pad B on Wednesday evening. Although Ship 24 was believed to have completed all the standalone testing needed to clear it for flight, additional testing may be necessary. On Thursday morning, SpaceX filled the Booster 7's oxygen tank with propellants and conducted a spin-prime test involving several of the Raptor engines. For those who are unaware, a spin-prime test typically involves using high-pressure gas to spin the engine turbines for a few seconds to test the plumbing. Thursday's test was the 10th overall spin-prime test of Booster 7. Minutes after the spin prime test, SpaceX conducted a full scale fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system test that lasted for about 30 seconds. Despite SpaceX's preparations and the alert notice it gave to the neighborhood, the static fire test did not take place on Thursday for some reason. The road was opened at around 5 p.m. local time, signaling the end of Thursday's tests. The static fire test campaign will resume as early as Monday, November 14. SpaceX will most likely try to static fire a few of the engines on Booster 7 initially, before moving incrementally up from there to eventually fire all 33 engines simultaneously. Booster 7 had conducted four static fire tests so far, the maximum number of booster engines that have simultaneously fired so far was seven, and it happened during a test in September. The information reports that SpaceX President and Chief Operating Officer Gwynne Shotwell will assume oversight of the company's Starship program and Starbase facilities, presumably filling in for CEO Elon Musk as he shifts his focus to Twitter.
Shotwell became president and COO of SpaceX in 2008, following her role in the successful negotiation of the first commercial resupply services contract with NASA. Shotwell worked primarily on SpaceX's Falcon, Dragon, and Starlink programs to date, and according to the information, her appointment is part of a reorganization at Starbase that follows a summer of strategy shifts and delays on Starship. There are also reports that Amit Afshar, a former Tesla executive who oversaw Gigafactory Texas, has recently been named vice president of Starship production at SpaceX. Now, let's go back to Starbase. SpaceX conducted a cryo-proof test of Starship 25 on November 7. Filling the ship's oxygen tank with liquid nitrogen began at 1.53 p.m. local time, and the tank was completely filled in nearly two hours. The tank was maintained in that state for the next 30 minutes, during which time the six hydraulic rams installed under the pad simulated the thrust of six Raptor engines by mechanically stressing the ship's thrust structure. The tank was then slowly drained, concluding the cryo-proof test that went on for about five hours. It was Ship 25's third overall cryo-proof test. The ship was removed from suborbital launch pad A the next morning, marking the completion of the cryo-proof test campaign. Hours later, a self-propelled modular transporter carried the ship back to the build site and moved it into the high bay. The ship will soon be fitted with six Raptor V2 engines to begin the static fire test campaign. Several Raptor engines were recently spotted being delivered to Starbase for installation into the ship and booster prototypes. SpaceX's McGregor Rocket Development and Test Facility continues to host Raptor engine testing. According to NASA Spaceflight, SpaceX recently conducted several Raptor vacuum engine long-duration firing, variable throttle tests, and sea-level engine rapid relight tests at McGregor. Teams recently installed the payload bay door on the payload bay section of Ship 27. Starlink satellites will be deployed into orbit from the payload dispenser through the payload bay door. Several Starlink satellites were delivered to the payload integration building at Starbase on Wednesday morning. The Starlink integration box was also spotted roaming outside the integration building on the same day. Once the satellites are loaded into the integration box, the box will transfer them into the payload dispenser installed inside the ship. Grid fin installation on the forward section of Super Heavy Booster 10 has begun. The methane tank section of the booster is already fully assembled, while the oxygen tank section is yet to be assembled. You might recall the three horizontal propellant storage tanks that were removed from the Starship portion of Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center a few weeks ago. Those tanks recently arrived at Starbase on a barge and were transported to the new SpaceX testing site located 7.5 kilometers away from Starbase. The tanks will be used to store propellants required for test tank cryo tests at this new site. The Kennedy Space Center Starship Orbital Launch Mount Table was recently spotted inside SpaceX Hangar M at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Teams have already installed some plumbing and support equipment on the launch mount table. Those components were not present on the Starbase launch mount table at the time of installation. The table inside Hangar M will be installed atop the launch mount legs at Pad 39A in the near future. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.